Cool. Let's just wait and see if a couple more people arrive. Good Give evening. I have recognised a few names there. Hugh Keen, culture vultures, people in search of knowledge, seekers, explorers, people on the journey. People doing something while uh, the uh, the things in the oven. Pete, um, while we're waiting, I don't know if you want to plug anything that's happening um, at Grow yeah. this week. I think you're the final event this week, but on Monday we have Julia Bell, David Stubbs um, in conversation about the publications, um, really techno and. Mars by 1980, a book about electronic music, hosted by Dr. K. Mitchell, um, which would be very interesting. Different perspectives on techno. And uh, another artist talk on uh, Tuesday with uh, Emily Hammer, Hannah, a local artist. Right, I'm going to do the intros because I think if people are late, we'll just let them in. Let me, let me go. So, welcome to Grow at Home. These are our artist talks. Um, it's a series where we will be uh, hearing from artists and uh, authors about their work and practice. Uh, Grow at Home was made possible by the Arts Council England Cultural Recovery Fund, which we're very thankful of. Um, we'll be live streaming tonight and uh, recording, and we sometimes use screenshots uh, for publicity. So please be aware that if you have your cameras on, you will be recorded. And if you're not comfortable with that, switch your video off. There will be a Q&A at the end. Please um, leave your questions in the chat. Simon actually wants some questions during the, he wants a kind of quite interactive kind of chat tonight. So I believe we're leaving um, unmuted mics and things like that, or you're putting questions in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll alert him. Um, so please participate and let's get this kind of uh, a natural kind of uh, in conversational event. Um, so all, the, all now really is to introduce our guest tonight is Simon Cole, a.k.a. Hackney Tours, who's been exploring Hackney Wick for a decade, trying to make sense of the changes. He may be a walking artist or even a running one or just a passionate dilettante. He's not sure labels help. He's a seeker, though, with more questions than answers. And he loves being out in the world, walking the streets and finding gold in the urban cracks. He also enjoys creating a space where we can all share our interpretations, opinions and reactions to the world around us. So he supposes he is a kind of psychogeographer, facilitator, provocateur. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Cole, Hackney Tours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pete. That's um, uh, a fantastic introduction. I mean, well, I mean, that, that's, uh, I actually wrote it, so maybe I shouldn't say that. That was fantastically delivered, but thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, um, so tonight, yeah, um, aka Hackney Tours, although with this sort of freedom and, uh, and liberty that Grow have, have, have uh, given me, and thank you so much, guys, for creating this space. I'm going to go a little bit more into my more, uh, the more personal side of things, myself and my own um, practice, rather than, for example, being the, uh, the conventional, um, hello, Hackney Tours, and we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at that. And there's going to be, well, actually, there always is something a little bit challenging, actually. But tonight, we're going to go, I hope it's okay with you guys. We're going to a little bit dark, actually, a little bit dark. But then we'll, we won't stay there. We'll come out at the other end. But I hope uh, that's okay with you guys. Just to go a little bit into um, shadows, because we're going to go into psychogeography, and we're going to talk a little bit about my own journey. And um, maybe some of it in this uh, interesting year, a lot of things going on, uh, will resonate with you. So... Um, actually, you know what? I'm, I'm going to start with the first picture. Um, I've got a feeling, actually, and a lot of people, when I show this picture, would go, what on earth is that? But I've got a feeling that, uh, actually, if I can just call this uh, up, give me two seconds. Sorry, guys, a little bit slow on the tech draw uh, there, actually. But um, just bear with me. Let's see if anybody can uh, recognise. Here we go. Sorry, I should have had that teed up. Uh, I've got a feeling that, for example, Hannah Terry uh, might be able to uh, tell us what this Which is. Which is on. Which is on. Lovely. Okay. <laughs> so, right. So, I don't know if anyone knows what that is. So I don't know. 
We, oh, um, okay, well, there's a clue coming. The clue coming. Stay tuned. Wick Wonders, the accidental psychogeographer. Um, what is psychogeography? To me, uh, to some, it's a nebulous and occasionally controversial concept. Um, but as I'm going to explain, we're probably practicing some of its uh, or many of its themes already on lockdown. Um, is it mindless, mindful, mapless, meandering? Is it esoteric, exploratory encounters? Or is it just being more in the world? How can the way we move around the city affect our sense of place and even who we are, which is the kind of basic dictionary definition of psychogeography, the effect of our surroundings on us. We're going to take a whistle stop tour from William Blake to Walter Benjamin via the Situationists, and then we're going to ask how we can experience the city afresh as I share decades of urban exploration and I try not to get lost in the rhizome, the rhizome, there's your clue, or disappear up my own metamodernist cul-de-sac. So that is a picture of the rhizome. If you know your Deleuze and Guattari, your Thousand Plateaus, that might be ringing a few bells. If not, just know that it's what's under our feet and it's the networks of non-hierarchical structures that make life possible, the creative mycelium and the actual mycelium. I've got a couple of quotes for you here. Here then is the pattern in my carpet, the sense of the eternal mysteries, the eternal beauty hidden beneath the crust of common and commonplace things. Hidden and yet burning and glowing continually, if you care to look with purged eyes. I think it's easier to discern the secret beauty and wonder and mystery in humble and common things than in the splendid and noble and storied things. And another quote from the same guy, Arthur Macken and the Art of Wandering. So here was the notion. What about a tale of a man who lost his way? who became so entangled in some maze of imagination and speculation that the common material ways of the world became of no significance to him. Arthur Macken and the London Adventure or the Art of Wandering, turn of the century fella. So hopefully this is sparking some thoughts. Stick them in the chat. Pete's already uh, mentioned that he's going to be looking at that. Let's make this, uh, I will respond to your responses so it can be really meta, right? Oh, meta. I tried to write an artist statement to see if I could condense what I do. And um, here it is. Hopefully this will, uh, it's quite hard though actually, decades of when you've got multiple interests and the rhizome is necessarily messy, non-hierarchical, sprawling, it goes all over the place. I am a multilingual international tour guide artist, a storyteller and writer exploring the overlap between the conventional mainstream historical mode of tourism and the contemporary practices of art and activism. By using a variety of techniques, such as stand-up style riffing, rhetorical questioning and offering provocations, I create a space where people feel safe enough to be taken to share their doubts and fears, to explore the limits of the social constructs that shape our reality. I am inspired by countercultural movements like the Situationists of Paris 68, a little picture there of, uh, see that there? Our Paris 68 or today's culture jammers like the space hijackers or the subvertisers. I return repeatedly to themes of recuperation and moral complexity in a world that seeks easy reductive answers and where commerce seeks to commoditize all in the act of neutralizing dissent and then selling it back to us, the aforementioned uh, recuperation. So hopefully I've got your permission to go uh, a little bit dark tonight. Um, because this is not a commercial tour, you're not going to review me at the end, so I can I can prod and provoke you a, a little bit. So, and if you're um, a little bit Buddhist or a little bit Taoist, then you'll know that you can't have the light without the dark, and uh, vice versa. So, um, yeah, please uh, respond to uh, what we're talking about tonight, um, because for me, it's all about connection. It's connection to our environment, uh, to those around us, to each other, and ultimately to ourselves. And I have a humanities background, so I've been deconstructing stuff for decades. My way into this was teenage activism and then mainstream tourism in later life. So, but starting to question who or what is not being mentioned. The unsaid sometimes, in fact, often says more than what we actually include. As anyone who's familiar with the idea of Carl Jung's shadow or William Blake's spectre will know. So part of that deconditioning, uh, which is what the original political version of psychodrophy was about, and we'll talk about this later, is about break down the walls and the constructs. So in that spirit, I'd like to step down from any supposed expert or lecturer status. I probably already did that by not having my slides queued up at the start and ask you to co-create um, something with me. So um, please respond to the thoughts and images. There's a little Q&A at the end. And then we'll, if you can use the chat to put things in, fill that up or just thoughts and ideas, concepts, 
uh, responses, emotions, anything really, just whack that in there. And then we'll do a little bit of co-creation. So uh, let's be playful as well, because um, the challenge for, for me with this, um, and with 2020, I think, and 2021 for a lot of us, is how to acknowledge some of the really dark things that are going on, like the existential threat of climate change, or the brutal realities of life and some of the places that our things come from, which we'll talk about what's going on out of sight in prisons or asylum centres, especially during COVID, and leaks in through the obscure tweets you sometimes might see, or stories from friends who are at Calais in the jungle, or just how my own life might be more difficult here in East London if I was experiencing deprivation, deprivation sorry, or, or racism, massive privilege check here and how to balance this, but with all the good things, um, all the colors is what I call it. And seeing the light and the dark and somehow reconciling them, well, it's difficult, isn't it? But Bill Drummond at the KLF said of Ken Campbell of Clapton, theater maker, uh, maverick theater maker extraordinaire, that the ability to hold two contradictory ideas was a strength as an artist. And I think many of us are experiencing this. Hence for some, the backlash against the complexity of postmodernism and the desire for simple narratives. Perhaps the rise of certain charismatic, though very flawed politicians can be attributed to this. Oh, we've got a couple of questions all ready. Um, thank you so much. Um, this is a good time, actually. There's a nice little segue into the next section. From tourism to Hackney Tours, um, how did I make the move? Because I moved here in Hackney and I discovered that, and I was thinking, imagine if you could do that job going around Europe and getting excited about history and things in your own backyard. And then I started looking at the history of Hackney and it's absolutely fantastic. I know people go, oh, the East End, of course, Stalin, Jack the Ripper, it's this, it's that. But actually, Hackney has hundreds of years of descent going back um, to the late 1600s. It's a place where people have rocked the boat, rebels, reformers, rabble rousers, revolutionaries. It's all gone on here. So I discovered, and for me, that was just naturally more interesting. I was like, you know, it's great that we've like talking about kings and queens of Buckingham Palace, but what about this? What about Mary Wollstonecraft? Totally upsetting the patriarchy in the 1790s um, and presaging uh, the suffragettes. And, um, and the question, what role does costume play? So costume for me is one of those things that just breaks up the normal rules. So for example, you go to a festival and you go somewhere different, it takes you out of your normal surrounds and people wear different clothes and they behave differently. Uh, there's an anarchist philosopher who calls those temporary autonomous zones. Um, and um, you can, you know, so normal rules are suspended. I always feel like when I'm wearing a costume, um, I actually, this is not even that sort of much of a costume for me really, but it gives me permission to uh, be more open and, and, and it also gives per people permission to approach me ask me questions and engage. So I think uh, it's a great, you know, there's a reason why we, we go away to festivals and we dress up, we do stuff there. So what is a walking artist? There are walking artist networks and am I one? My own journey is I've struggled quite a lot with those labels. For example, in, um, sorry, I just turned my, my WhatsApp there, I was using it to get the link to turn that off. Um, my own journey was I grew up in a place where I didn't know any artists. Um, and they was kind of like, you know, strange, exotic people that in my own um, uh, knowledge used paint uh, on canvas and, you know, wore kind of smocks and things like that. And it wasn't really until I went to um, the turning point was a trip to the Getty and the uh, MoMA in San Francisco in 2007 with docents who brought alive museums and brought alive art. And for me, that was a massive kind of turning point. And I was like, oh, OK. And it was a way in and Hackney Wick has been a way in to the people and the things happening there. It's been a way in for me um, for, uh, and, and it's yeah, changed my life. It really has. But I struggle with those labels um, because we're all creative, right? I mean, who's to do? <clears throat> so what is, what, what separates someone who's creative uh, with drawing uh, from someone who's creative with engineering or in Hackney Wick with someone who is creative in the way that they organize their life, you know, the German concept of the Lebenskunstler, the life artist. So creativity, creativity comes in many forms and I'm a little bit sort of wary sometimes of being put in a box or putting other people in box and excluding the people that are not in that box. So my current incarnation is only about uh, a decade old. But I think that artists often have a very particular mindset, uh, like writers or other seekers, to use Ken Campbell's word, people that are looking for something. 
uh, they're curious intellectually or they want to just test the limits. You know, I, I really do believe that artists can show us other ways of living our lives, um, other ways of being. They can explore that, but also they go places so that we don't have to. You know, I mean, on a really like kind of pop culture level, the Die Hard series is so popular, but who wants to be stuck in a skyscraper with terrorists trying to kill you, right? Nobody. People go for the vicarious thrill. Artists act things out uh, so that we don't have to. So, um, so I started to question things in conventional tourism, right? Because I started to wonder, you know, you're at the change of the guard uh, and you've got this hugely value laden uh, state theater, right? With all its history and its implied traditions and social norms as it reinforces notions of nobility, which are from um, millennia ago, you know, a, a pre-enlightenment world. Um, but if you criticize it or say it, might, it should change, then you'll be accused of being political. Oh, why do you have to be political? So that was my, um, that was my way in to, I started to think about, you know, why, why are we saying this? Why are we not saying that? Who decides what we can talk about um, and, and what we can't, you know? Um, for example, there was for a long time when you came off the Eurostar with your coach party in Paris, the first thing you would see is a massive homeless um, uh, community living under the flyover at Gare du Nord on the edge of uh, Pigalle. And, you know, some people say, oh, well, you don't talk about that. Just kind of do this. But then how can you how can you not talk about that? So uh, I started to I plant little seeds, you know, we're walking past the Ministry of Defence and, and I might say something like, oh, there's the Ministry of War. Depends on your language and your politics. Um, and let's not forget the, 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 the change of the guard. We live in a country where 30 percent of the UK land, according to Guy Shrubsoul, is owned by the nobility. So, you know, that's quite interesting. Even if you're not, you know, kind of you don't want to change that or you don't think that's something to be uh, interested in. It's just an interesting fact, isn't it? Did you know that according to this guy who did some research, 30% of UK land is owned by the nobility in 2021? World War II tours, where are the women, where were the bodies, where, where were, let's be honest about this, where are the boys crying for their mothers um, in a field hospital, you know, with a leg hanging off? Because when you do your research about war, that's what happens. Um, you know, the, all the French, the phenomenal amount of French people that we killed just by accident when we were um, bombing uh, military targets in France. And I'd go to the war museums and I'd see all this stuff. And I'd be like, well, where are, where are the women? Where are the refugees? Where are the children? Where were the old people, you know, kind of that were sort of caught in air raids and things like that? Um, and, and why? Why don't these, uh, why isn't the last thing you see when you leave a, uh, a war museum? Why isn't it like a massive question mark saying, that's awful, isn't it? How's about we try to never do that again? You know, it's the kind of the fatalist perpetuation of the status quo that I, I start to get a little bit uncomfortable with. Um, you know, it's like what psychologists call scripts, but on a, a societal level. And then I didn't move to um, Berlin. Is it more about being creative as an engineer or making art? Oh, my interest. You know, these. this is kind of... Well, these are the big questions, aren't they? How do we define creativity? Who is it for? Who's allowed to do it? Um, who we celebrate, who we don't. If we've got the right language to celebrate creativity. I mean, I kind of feel like at the moment, um, a dilemma for people in the arts is, do we buy into the business speak and we start evaluating everything and, and coming out with all these stats and things? Or do we say, actually, no, guys, it's not about that. This is about something that makes us human. It's much more fun fundamental than that. And we're not going to get into your world of charts and graphs and uh, uh, things like this. I mean, when I, as an educational tour guide, um, I have to say that the, the things that really make my eyes light up was when the kids had some free time and they went off and they navigated the tube by themselves for the first time on their first trip to Europe. And they had to fight the teenagers for the freedom to do that. And you can't show that in a brochure. But isn't that a beautiful uh, example of young people growing and blooming? And something that you can't put in, um, it's not in the brochures, but to, to us, that was the highlight. Um, in, uh, Pauline asked about um, what sort of responses you got. You know what, Pauline? Um, I, here's the thing. I find people to be actually quite open if you approach them in the right way. Um, I walked down Westminster uh, explaining to a guy who flew military transports in the Gulf War how I'd walked down there protesting against it. 
and we basically agreed to respect each other's opinions and the two went absolutely fine and i know some of my colleagues well, we can't do that but actually i think we we sort of sometimes don't give people enough credit for their intelligence and for their their sensitivity um so um many people would more want the usual diet yeah um i think i think there probably is a hunger but you just it's not it's it's niche it's niche a lot of people i think especially at the moment this way you have to be you have to be fair i think a lot of people are, are, are just barely keeping it together at the moment and e even in general life a lot of people people are working 60 or 70 hours a week they're rinsed by the time they get home and so not everybody has the bandwidth i understand to go into stuff we're going to talk about tonight about you know where our stuff comes from um and things like that and i think you have to understand that um if you're thinking about maslow's hierarchy of needs I think I'm quite high up it because, you know, a lot of people are really struggling right now and a massive privilege check. Um, so in 2007, I discovered East Berlin. I was a little bit late to the party. Uh, I'd missed all the post-war era. Um, but I discovered an amazing warehouse subculture in Hackney and Hackney Wick. And it was great. And I threw myself into it. But I started to find out that nothing was quite what it seemed, right? Because it was like, oh, I'm in Hackney at the most exciting time to be here, just like Berlin. But the flip side of being the coolest place in town and um, Grow can tell you all about this uh, means also being in a place that's gentrifying. Uh, it meant seeing your friends priced out. It meant too looking at your own role in the, in the process. You know, um, a friend said to me, and he's, he's a bit older, he'd been around the block a few times, and he said, the praise of those that love it will kill it. And I didn't understand what he meant at the time, but now I do. So I started doing alternative tours in Hackney and they were quite discursive and polemical, um, beginning with the stories of proto-suffragette Mary Wollstonecraft, who finally, after a lot of campaigning, has a statue, a monument, her first one, uh, in Newton Green. Uh, and then the changes, good and bad, caused by the Olympics to people in um, here in Hackney Wick. And I suppose I was hyping it even if I would try and provoke all sorts of questions about the values of a city where property greed is allowed to just run riot and market rate covers all sorts of abuses and cynical practices. And I found myself in the middle of a, a debate in Hackwick about these changes. And, you know, was it, was it gone? Was it in the process of going? Was it a new evolution? Were people fighting a battle for the good stuff? You know, things like this at Grow in Hackneywick? Or were they desperately hanging on to a scene that had died, as all scenes do, in a city that's always in flux? And should they have just let things go? I was more participant observer than commentator because I was living it. And I got involved in campaigns to save Stour Space of Victoria Wharf. Both were ultimately unsuccessful. But if I don't tell the story of cynical property dealings, you know, um, how can I claim any kind of truth? If you just edit out anything negative, then that's just PR, right? So evoking uh, the KLF burning a million pounds, we actually burned the... Uh, the petition that um, we made to try and save. I'm just going to show you a little video here now. We, we had a petition to try and save Victoria Wharf. Uh, it was ultimately successful and they built a bridge that nobody wanted. Nobody seemed to be able to actually justify um, as well. And it was a bit of a, I've got to say, a little bit of a uh, sort of the scales fell from my eyes um, a little bit. So Hackney Wick has given me a lot tremendously, but I kind of also feel like I've lost my innocence here a little bit as well. So this is the petition, like more than a thousand names. So rude, so pathetic. Exactly. Well. So that was on the pontoon at Stower Space. And that was that pun, uh, petition was full of lots of lovely comments about why we need creative spaces and why we need places like Hackney Wick. And of course, in the COVID year, the arts are more important than ever because we've got so much to, to process, right? And this is why spaces like Grow and series like this are, are, are really important. Um, now, I want to show you um, something else, a little shot. So I, I was uh, trying to uh, push the envelope, explore and expand uh, the genre. So uh, I started doing, trying different things, branching out a, a little bit. So for example, uh, hang on. Uh, ah, right. This has gone big for some reason. I don't know why it's done that. This is for anti-university. 
anti-university some people think is literally against universities it's not it's the idea it's the original anti-university was Rillington Street 1968 the idea that anyone can teach anything so we did a walk there why this uh, shit matters um what price art in London uh, as the artists and the galleries started to disappear from um Hackney Wick and it was that was super interesting I don't know if anyone's got any opinions or questions because on that people did and it was really interesting uh, because people ask questions like, well, who is this for? And sadly, they, sometimes they say things like, well, I don't think it's for me. And, you know, is this the sort of London we necessarily want? So it was um, it was an interesting experiment. And I, my journey has been to realise that uh, if you hold a space for people and allow to, uh, this co-creation to take place, then um, things get a lot more uh, a lot more interesting because everyone's got something to bring everyone's got something to offer so if you allow them in suddenly things become a lot more interesting now i'm just going to share this i've got a little film just to set the scene for psychogeography in hackney wick hopefully you can see i'm sure pete or jordana or david will let me know if you can't see this hackney wick it's forever Shifting, evolving, changing, mutating. Look at all the layers. Post Olympic London, Victorian factory town. The heady days of the 80s when over there apparently there was more money than they knew what to do with in the printing game. And then the artist colony. Beneath us, the Hackney Cut from the late 1700s bringing vegetables from the home counties into london so much to take in you can travel in four dimensions if you know the history but even if you don't you can just walk you can look It's the perfect place for whatever psychogeography is. The great thing about psychogeography is people can't agree on what it is. So it's one of those things that kind of like, you know, whatever you're doing, um, yeah, then you're basically, you're basically doing it, you know. Um, so that's a little bit of a flavour of, of why Hackney Wick is so, so rich in themes, intersections. And for me, psychogeography is about being stimulated, finding a flow state, but it's also about breaking conditioning. And that's why we might just take a wander. The Derive was the, uh, the, the 1950s, um, Guy Debord, Society of the Spectacle, Situationists. The Derive is their way of breaking those kind of uh, conventions. Uh, and we did, I did one with um, Doomed Gallery in Dalston. I don't know if Ken's with us tonight from Doomed Gallery, another subcultural art space that is now suddenly closed but exists online and is still doing projects so look out for the doomed gallery name because there's going to be more stuff coming up shortly um or at stone newton literary festival i've got these things here like this is fiona weir's um walking weirdly uh there you go and these are cards and they might break you out of your habits by saying uh, walk towards the first sound you hear stop and listen when you reach it follow sound after sound so Allow yourself to be led by the sounds you find. Um, Sonia Overall, Drift Deck. And if we pull out one here at random, find three different surfaces. So I don't know if anyone's noticed that there's a lot, I think, in common with psychogeography and mindfulness um, as well. So, um, so they said that it would put you in touch with your authentic desires because maybe you've been inculcated actually with the desires that society thinks you should have. And Guy Debord and modern culture jammers both talk about the idea that we've been conditioned to think that owning a car is a massive privilege. And so we're willing to work all the hours that God sends or the universe sends uh, to, in order to be able to afford this massive privilege, which we think is a, um, uh, a motor car. Um, oh, just in the chat, Doomed Gallery, Doomed, D-O-O-M-E-D, -O -O Doomed Gallery. Um, there's a group in Birmingham doing walks that are called, uh, I saw them at a psychogeography event, and they call it extreme noticing, which I think is great. We haven't taken so much at any one time, right? And I sometimes jokingly refer to tour guiding as being sort of, you know, um, fancy pointing. 
you know, going, hey, look at this. Because we're surrounded by wonder all the time, but we can only take in so many bits of information at any one time. And so what we have to do is focus on things and we, we can miss the little things, you know, going granular, zooming in, or just seeing things in a, in a different way, like superimposing one place on top of another. And we'll actually do that later on. You'll see a, a bit of that. Um, for example, the other day I was by the marshes in Hackney and within my sight line, I could see a river where medieval types had brought food to London. Saxons had argued over Lammas lands and now Thames Water were bringing us the clean water that stopped cholera while over their heads, the national grid pylons brought us megavolts, the miracle that is electricity, right? I mean, I still boggle at these things. I'm looking at a screen that nullifies distance so I can communicate with you. In metal boxes overhead, people fly at hundreds of miles per hour uh, and defy gravity. And we have clean drinking water that never mixes with our sewage. And if you've read the history of London in the 1850s, that's quite a big deal. We take so much for granted. I can do that and take an image and capture it. Have you seen the Bayer Tapestry? It took so long to sew, to represent an image. It's incredible, it blows my mind. And I think recovering that sense of wonder is something that you can get from um, psychogeography. And when you do study the history, then you see how much and how fast London can change. Um, and of course that goes both ways. You know, think about the industrial revolution, it goes both ways because uh, look at COVID, we've seen how fast the world can change, not necessarily in a good way. Um, and I've listened to two authors recently both say that we can't save ourselves now. We have wrecked the planet. All we can do is be good on the way out. So, but on a more positive uh, note, in Refining Wonder, I think this is where we can connect, connect with the amazing in lockdown if we polish up our sense of curiosity because we've been forced to stay local and rediscover our own backyard. And I was already, sadly, some people shielding have been forced to rediscover their own house. Um, or flat. Um, I was already exploring this because I was becoming more environmentally aware. I'd, uh, I'd appeared in a, a Berlin travel anthology precisely because I'd written my experiences of East Berlin's alternative areas up while I was in a flow state. And that's what I would get from going to nearly 50 countries. I'd walk around like this, wide eyed, open mouth, in an absolute flow state, just taking everything in. It was amazing. Now I'm more environmentally aware. And you start to think, oh, are we actually like the beach, Alexander Garland? Are we actually starting to destroy the things that we're celebrating? So, you know, the irony of we fly long haul to go and see a coral reef, uh, global, war uh, global warming, et cetera, et cetera. Um, carbon is the uh, elephant in the travel room. So I start to wonder, can, can I get that travel buzz closer to home? Alan de Botton, the idea that um, if tra travel is a reaction in your head, right, to where you are, what if you could kind of get that reaction? just walking through the middle of, um, of, of wherever you live. And this way of moving is a kind of mindfulness as well. We are deconditioning. We are recalibrating, you know, um, going <laughs> under lockdown, going to the supermarket is, is a, an adventure now. Um, I dream of a night in Margate as if it was a trip to the moon, um, you know, or, or a fortnight in Thailand. The flip side is that I hear the birds more in Hattie Marshes. I walk more slowly, I think more, I meditate more, I train my body more, and I sit with myself and allow old grievances or trauma to resurface and then heal. The biggest journey is not out there, but inside. And you don't have to be the Buddha or walk to Canterbury to go on a pilgrimage. I think in a way, like it or not, we're all on one, but it's an internal one. William Blake had his fourfold vision. I talk about moving in 4D. William Blake was described by Merlin Coverley as being the godfather of psychogeography. And 4D is how I feel when I know the area's history or I've been joining various dots. It's like being in Cable Street and imagining the scene of the battle. It's all sorts of things like, well, you know, what? I'll give you a little, um, I'll give you a, a little taste of something I wrote for a pamphlet by the artist Louisa Albani. Um, we did a pamphlet on William Blake. Let me just quickly give you a little image, something pleasing uh, to look at while I do that. Okay, isn't it beautiful? She does the most wonderful um, artwork. Louisa Albani, A-L-B-A-N-I. She does um, people like <clears throat> Virginia Woolf, Mary Wilsoncraft, the Romantics, she's big into the Romantics. 
So this is my writing to go with one of her images. Let's all go, let's all go down the Strand. In a pub said to be the former coal cellar of the Savoy Hotel, tourists marvel at an interior ignored by office workers. In its earlier incarnation as the Fountain Tavern, Walpole's enemies plotted against a prime minister who seemed to sail through every storm unscathed. In nearby Whitehall, history repeats itself. Blake died in Fountain Court long after the Strand had been palatial, but before Dickens wrote about the rookery slums of Covent Garden. Squalor still survives. I recognise a man I knew 25 years ago. He'd wanted to become a policeman. Now, on bended knee, he talks quietly to one of the homeless people, slumped against the wall of a bank in a gesture of defeated irony. A vision of dark uniform is transcended by a pale, soft face and a gentle refrain. Are you all right, mate? Are you all right? In the words of Ackroyd, Londoners are assaulted by difference. Driving on the right-hand side of the road opposite, crucial London esoterica for middle managers involved in midweek pub quizzes, cabbies continue to pull out of the Savoy's atypical entrance. Tourists buy more coffee and swap more notes under monitors showing exchange rates. To the east in the city, big money manipulates the markets. To the west in Whitehall, discreet discussions in private rooms plot the course of the nation. Are you all right, mate? Are you all right? Angels don't just appear to poets in Peckham. And that's a reference to William Blake seeing angels in a tree in Peckham. The idea of uh, you can see things that other people can't see. Maybe you're seeing across the ages, across the centuries at the same time. Uh, and that was something that happened to me in um, the Strand when I recognised that guy I hadn't seen for about 20 years and he wanted to be a policeman. And he was showing a lot of care to a guy who was in a bit of a bad way. Um, so, any questions in the, um, the chat, by the way? I don't think we've got, um, no, I don't think at the moment, feel free to, oh, we've got something something new and whack something in. Uh, da -da. Do you think it's a tentative similar similarity with Hackneywick and Kreutzberg before the wall came down? New York in the 80s, Pete, you are, as usual, sir, ahead of the game. You are ahead of the game, more of that. Anon, go back to the images. In fact, actually, this lead, this lead, lead us on actually to um, the next image. This is something I put together by being struck by the similarities uh, between, as I felt, between Hackney Wick and Berlin. I discovered East Berlin, I saw the changes, all the things going on. Uh, and so now when I walk in Hackney Wick, I'm still, or when I work in East Berlin, I'm simultaneously walking in the artist heavy post industrial landscape of two cities at once. Although, of course, Leipzig is the new Berlin, uh, and that was happening in 2007. And of course, both of the eastern part of the city, traditionally poorer, and yet in the cracks like this is where you find the good stuff. And I've run the Iron Curtain in Germany in the Berlin Wall too, and when the bright lights of the Westfield went up and commerce came ever closer to Hackney Wick, I couldn't help but start to make analogies. And I've got actually a little video for you here which I just want you to have a, a look at this and then see if you can work out, as I'll show you this, so you can work out what is um, Hackney Wick and what is um, East Berlin. Now there is one bit where I say, here we are in Berlin. Obviously you don't get any points for um, working that bit out, but the other bit, I'm just gonna start it and I'm just gonna make it uh, full screen. There we go. Hopefully that's big enough for you there. Pete will tell me if it's not big enough. Okay. It's mostly silent. If you want, you can unmike and shout if you recognize the places. It's about five minutes long, just so you know.
Bornhummer Strasse. This is the S-Bahn station. And this bridge was where, on 9th of November 1989, overwhelmed border guards gave up trying to keep back the people and waiting for an order from high command that never came. And eventually they gave up. And across this bridge here, they flooded in from the east for their first glimpse of West Berlin to see what it was like. What an amazing night that must have been. The Bersbrücke was the northernmost checkpoint in the Berlin Wall. And the first one to open on that night in Berlin when the pressure got too much for the border guards. And according to information here, 20,000 people streamed across in that first hour. There you go. I imagine a lot of you would be able to spot uh, Schlieber das S-Bahn. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, but the, you know, the most kind of sinister images there, and I played with the, the sort of, you know, you'd expect the sinister stuff to be in black and white, I kind of feel like mono, and then the more colourful, but you know, the, the, the most sinister stuff there in black and white, it was all from the Olympics in 2012, when they had um, soldiers on the towpath, like the, the border was absolutely incredible, an 18,000 volt, I believe it was, electric fence, um, it was absolutely phenomenal, and so it really, really did feel like there's the uh, the rich west over here, and then there's a kind of like a simpler way of life over here. I'm making huge generalizations, but you know, over here in the east, and that border was going to come down. Everyone knew it was going to come down. Everyone knew there were going to be massive changes coming in in Hackney Wick, and so when I when I walk around, I, I'm simultaneously in uh, two places at once, um, kind of experiencing all those things. At, uh, at once, and that was a video I made for uh, Open House to explore the uh, the similarities there. Now, coming back to um, a little bit of German for you. Now we've got a little bit of French. Sur le pavé, la plage. Sur le pavé. Oh, I've got a little comment there from Jordana in the um, in the chat. The helicopters. Literally, I was sat in. Um, you could be sat in White Post Lane trying to talk to someone, and you couldn't for the noise of the helicopters. It was like something out of Apocalypse Now. I think they were practicing for the um, opening uh, display, which was, um, it was an interesting night, the opening night. Uh, I actually cycled down to Stratford High Road and watched the police arresting 200 critical mass riders 
who defied the police instruction not to go near the Olympic site, um, had their bikes loaded onto trucks while they were arrested and put on double-decker buses. And of course, uh, simultaneously inside the stadium, people were watching the bikes do their thing, in the, um, uh, the which is a lovely little irony. And I only knew because I saw it on Twitter and I was nearby. I was in Hackney Wick. I said, oh, I'm going to check that out. But um, yeah, little hidden histories, things that you don't um, necessarily normally hear. But yes, the situation has had a slogan, Paris 68, sur le pavé, la plage, underneath the paving stones, the beach, the idea that there's, there's a better world just within reach. We just have to stop running on automatic. We have to break our conditioning and break out, take off this mask by being distracted, um, stop being distracted by what Guy Debord called the society of the spectacle. I know um, Jordana has a strong interest in this and has a strong belief that Grow should be a place where you don't, you can come even if you haven't got any money. You can just come and enjoy the free music. People can mingle because that's more important than this. Well, yeah, you can come in, you can meet people, but only if you're going to spend 20 or 30 pounds. And it's an ethical experiment, Grow, which is why obviously it's, 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 um, it's hanging in there, but it's not easy because it's not easy to be ethical in um, London in 2021. Um, and one of the big things there about, um, so we're talking about active creation, right? It's like the opposite of TV, which is passive consumption. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are totally rinsed by their jobs. And the state's quo relies on that to an extent, because if you've just worked 70 hours or whatever, and you're absolutely exhausted, you haven't got the bandwidth to start thinking about like, well, where does my stuff come from? Who made this? Because you're basically just functioning. And I, I live that lifestyle um, too. So uh, the shipping containers that come through Hackney Wick with all our stuff in, um, you know, we don't question, we don't question that. Um, and yet we need to, because it's otherwise it's the life unexamined, right? So, and it's, but it's difficult, of course, and there are a lot of contradictions here and I haven't really, I haven't got any answers. Uh, I mean, I think I'm in good company, right? I don't some of the great philosophers say that the ultimate answer is that there are no answers. Reconciling contradictions is uh, it's quite a tough thing. And it obviously that's where you get things like cognitive dissonance and things like that. And that's where I think a lot of people are struggling with the, the, the holes and breaks in the system, the, the issues. Oh, sorry, is it, did the sound go there momentarily? I've got a comment from Robert, not being able to hear. Is it okay now? Give me a little wave, Jordana, if the sound's okay. Yeah, great, thank you. We can you. hear you, I'm, I, I'm not okay. sure if Robert can. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're getting it clear at our end. Hopefully you can hear okay, uh, Robert. I don't know if it's your own internet. It always plays up, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, oh, yes, yeah, so I was going to show you a little picture there. So all these contradictions, which I'm still working out myself. I think it's the, it's the big struggle of our time. Um, let me show you some more pictures here. Um, move things along a little bit. So this is the old, uh, you're leaving the uh, American sector, entering the French sector, et cetera, et cetera. And now you're entering. And this is the idea that Hackney Wick is this kind of special zone where things are a little bit different, you know? Sur le pavé, this is actually Stour Space on Fish Island. Uh, somebody went around writing Sur le pavé on lots of places. Don't know who that could have been. And here's, uh, here's where I, I ended up by looking, following the lines from, you know, the rhizome, where does it lead to? Well, it leads to some surprising places. In Hackney Week, it led me to start thinking about where our stuff comes from. Um, and I started asking, well, what are in these boxes? Turns out 90% of our stuff in the global north is in these boxes, right? And you can actually track where they come from. They come from like China, uh, all of Asia, and, and you can track them as ships go all around the world through the Suez Canal, um, other side of the world. And I was kind of struck that, the, the changes in Hackney Wick, as, as people stop living communally in warehouses uh, where they share maybe one cooker, a couple of fridges, now we're all gonna be in our atomized little boxes and we're all gonna need our own cooker, our own TV set, our own this, our own that. And if, so, you know, you can see when you're in Hackney Wick, you can really see the mechanisms of global capitalism at play which is, you know, macro level with the, the big property deals, but right down to the micro as well, how people live and, um, you know, all that kind of thing. So it caused me to think about, well, it caused me to start a project called Container Cult. And it led me uh, to, next thing, you, you start off in Hackney Wick, the next thing you're looking at radar screens, watching ships disappear from the screen in um, off the, the coast of Africa, and then you're asking, oh, why does, why does that happen? And then you find out things like this, that sometimes it's to avoid picking up refugees. Um, and these are the sort of massive ships that you discover can carry 20,000 containers of stuff. That's just one ship 
and the ships are going all the time, constantly, they never stop. That's why I ended up following uh, the, uh, the lines from Hackney Wick. And of course, back in Hackney Wick, uh, things are changing. Property money is buying things up. Um, and, if, and so I did this mural here of a crane. And as you can see, the crane is like a sort of bird of prey and it's pecking at its surroundings. And Pete has got some similar uh, motifs as well, actually. Um, and you can see it, it's echoing the crane up there. Uh, and I spent ages doing that. And then a couple of years later, I saw something like that on someone else's artwork. And I was like, where'd you get that from? And they said, oh, it's on clip art. So it took them about five seconds, but there you go. Um, any thoughts on um, any thoughts on that, on how psychogeography, because you might've thought that it's going to be a super local thing, right? It's only going to be about Hackney Wick, but we're talking about the global themes here of power and, and, and money, military industrial complex, global capitalism. Uh, all those kind of things. And of course, um, Guy de Boer was writing in the 1950s uh, when um, uh, it was coming just after the, the nihilism and the, you know, the existentialists come out of World War II. And it's not surprising because it was a really bleak time and we'd seen how awful people could be uh, to each other. We were deposing the, uh, the rulers of Iran so we could have a coup and guarantee cheap oil from the Shah. And if you want to know why Iran is unstable and hard lying today, sorry, it's hard lying today. Look at what Britain was doing there in the 1950s. I mean, that's something you don't hear a lot about in his. So all these kind of um, hidden stories were coming out as I just followed my nose and the roots to see where um, I ended up. Now, I'm not telling you what to think with any of this stuff because I'm still processing it, assessing it myself. And of course, there are more questions than answers. But these are kind of like prisms that you might want to pick up and just try them and say, OK, that's a way uh, of looking at the world. And OK, that's another way of looking at the world. We were having a discussion today about Adam Curtis, about what is his own particular um, critique style. And apparently he's really not into um, historical materialism, so he's not really into how, how economics affect things. Whereas for a lot of people, like, well, how can you ignore economics? It's not just about um, ideas. But of course, it's important that um, Hackney Wick stays interesting, not just for uh, the uh, the old guard, if you want to call them that, who uh, are here, but also for the the new residents, right? Because they've been told, they've been sold the idea of a uh, vibrant trademark, they always say vibrant, a creative neighbourhood. So Hackney Wick does need to stay interesting, not just for those of us that have been for, around for a while, but for all the new residents, so they can have access to culture and arts, especially in this trying time. And that's just something I blogged there about why we need these spaces and the function that they perform and which is coming up actually sort of getting towards the end now so don't worry hang in there if you're um a little bit uh, uh brain drained we've got some questions actually um bitter lake is all about economics affecting things i'll have to read that um on a derive is there a place that comes to mind you end up with and who well actually we're going to finish on a, on a positive action, we're going to finish on a picture from uh, the derive that we did with Ken in Dalston. And it was very playful and it was very creative. And we cut holes in boxes and used them as binoculars and all sorts of like stuff like that. Uh, and of course it should be, it should be playful, it should be fun. And I'm finding that um, as I, as I, as I get older and, and you, you know, in Jungian terms, I get more into myself, more and more, I'm, I'm having to, be true to what I actually think and say and you know if you don't think that something is okay or it doesn't sit with your values then increasingly yeah, I'm turning into one of those grumpy older guys right it's, oh, it's, oh. but you know you have to kind of tell your truth you know because when you get to like the age I'm at now if I'm not telling my truth now then I'm, I'm never going to and so you know getting into uh, the, the more artistic side of things freedom to play a little bit more and um just very recently, as we come sort of towards the end of things, I just want to show you something that we did um, recently in Hackney Wick with some people called The People Speak. And uh, The People Speak, they are the creators of something wonderful, which I talked about atomized societies, right? It's called um, Tokioki. And it's a great thing because it brings people together to, to talk, to connect. And of course, when you connect with people, you can't be manipulated. If someone says, oh, those guys, all X are Y, you can say, well, actually, you know, I've met a lot of X um, and they're not Y, actually. That's not true. So uh, it stops the othering. It makes us connect. And increasingly, I start to think that um, connecting with people um, is political with a small p. And the Wix Speaks project, we created a first, it was a multi-platform ground up tour where we asked locals what we should know about Hackney Wick. 
and what they thought about the changes. And of course, we've got a plurality of views. You know, there's a Sainsbury's just opened in Hackney Wick. It's a really big deal. It's like when Crate first opened and some people are for it and some people are not. And that's what we got with Wick Speaks. And I'm moving increasingly towards a space where you facilitate a space where people can, I'll we'll go back one actually, where people can um, talk um, about these things. Um, and um, I just have their say, you know, co-create rather than being talked down, lectured to, you know, top down, that kind of thing. And then Walter Benjamin, I followed these, um, I started looking at borders and refugees and where the containers are going. And I ended up not just in Rotterdam, but I also ended up in a little place on the, uh, the French Spanish border where Walter Benjamin, who's big in psychogeography because he wrote about Baudelaire's Flaneur um, and the arcades of Paris, and he ended up dying here on the border as a refugee. And so I ended up following the trail all the way out there to um, Paul Boo, it's called, or Paul Bow, it's been on your Prince Nation on the Franco-Spanish border. So bring people together, empower them, give them a sense of agency and autonomy, which at the moment with events that are massive structural events that are out of our hands can make us feel powerless. Um, give us a sense of, of control or just, you know, that we've got some agency in our own lives and give people, and this is why I love the street art of Hackney Wick, give people the tools for philosophical inquiry so that we can ask questions um, of the world. And we just got a little question, I think, in the, the chat, but actually we'll go back to, um, because we want to finish on a high, right? Because you've got to look at the darkness, we've got to look at the light as well. See on there, someone's someone's written Sur le Pavé la plage again. And this is in answer to Jordana's question. This is the back streets of Dalston. This is the Derive with Ken from Doom Gallery. And um, you know, we played and we danced in the streets, you know, Gene Kelly style. Um, little fun thing to do. And, and this participant, she just got up there and without being asked, decided someone else climbed on something and was waving down um, from high up. Uh, which is great, very childlike. And then this person just jumped up and started to perform for us this little impromptu dance. And, you know, kind of um, that was what she felt like in that moment, as opposed to we're going to go over here, guys, and we're going to look at this because this is what's important. And who knows if we practice this form of um, kind of mindfulness uh, every day, then just maybe we could get to this situation here. This is under a bridge by the palm tree when I was walking down to Hackney Wick one day and I saw that and it made me very happy. So there you go. Thank you for your, um, for indulging me, listening to me. Um, we've got a few, uh, Paul Bao. I think it is pronounced Port Bao apparently. Well, actually I think the French would say Paul Bou because it's o -U, uh, O-U. But bon. I do believe that in um, Catalonia, they do indeed say Port Bao, yeah. Um, bon. Yeah. So, because uh, it's on the border, so obviously, uh, and the, the OU sound is different in French and Spanish, isn't it? So, which means you can't really be wrong. <laughs> so, um, hopefully, that was um, interesting for you. There's, some, uh, there's a lot to chew on there. I know it's quite dense, um, but hopefully, you can take something from that and just process it over the next few days. When you go out on a walk, maybe you can uh, go granular, zoom right in. Uh, maybe you could do an old psycho geography trick where you take a map from somewhere else. So you take a map of Berlin, for example, and you use it to navigate your way around Wick or just see things in, in a different way. Or maybe you see the ghosts of Romans next time you're walking through the city of London. Mm, I don't know, but hopefully uh, you took something from that that was useful. I thank you very much for your attention to grow and um, for putting this on. And um, if you want to stick around and have a, like a, a brief chat or discussion, then that'd be great. Thank you, Simon. Um, that was an amazing uh, piece of performance art and a journey in every sense of the word. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just say thank you to our invisible, um, but very, very important engineer, David, who's been facilitating this as well. Um, thanks, man. Um, I think, yeah, it'd be great to have a discussion. Maybe if we, if we're all well behaved, we'll turn our mics on. Maybe we can ask Simon some questions or if, if we want to participate. So we've got a question from, um, or sorry, a comment from Sarah. Her dissertation, she's just passed a PhD recently, actually. She's a doctor and she's, she's writing about a lot of these issues about the quarticization and instrument, instru instrumentalization of culture and that kind of thing. Um, and she's... Um, her dissertation on um, artists as gentrifier, controversial, 
uh, was one of my gateways into Hackney Wick, actually. So it's lovely to see a comment, friend. And she says, I've been reading about distraction recently, about the idea that distraction is a provisional state in which we're feeling our way through things without resolution, which is, she, in, oh, she always has something quite insightful and interesting to say. Jan say, and feel free to come on and please articulate these sentiments yourself. Jan saying, I, that's definitely how I view Hackney and its layers. Um, thank you. Um, Margot from uh, The People Speak, who's also a, a brilliant theatre maker. So thank you very much for your comment that you enjoyed that. Jordana loves the four. I'm doing your job, Pete. Sorry, you're meant to be doing this, aren't you? <laughs> you just took over. I mean, how can I stop you? <laughs> I've just talked about empowering people and I've just taken over your job. I'm sorry. Well, I think it's a bit weird. It, uh, it's probably a bit weird now if I pass it on to you. It's like being on a ship or something. I was like... Another question for Simon. Another question for Simon. Simon, you know, <laughs> just a bit mad, isn't it? So, um, yeah, if people want to just kind of participate, uh, I can see some friendly faces there, like Robert uh, Stone who who knows quite a bit about Spain, I believe, and has been singing. I've seen you singing many songs at the um, our, our, uh, Nights in the Royal Sovereign a few years back, which are Spanish Civil War songs and that. So I reckon his pronunciation of uh, Pubo or whatever is uh, probably absolutely bang on. <laughs> hey, I was also something... in, in Berlin before the war, before the war came down. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. How I was that? I didn't do much exploring, mind you. <laughs> I imagine what it was, was a lot more difficult at that point. Huh? I imagine it was a lot more difficult at that point. Yeah, well, yeah, it would have been, yeah. <laughs> what were you doing there? Kreuzberg was good. Well, uh, just living, really, you know, doing a bit of theatre and, uh, you know, teaching English, hanging out in the bars, <laughs> going to the all night. Yeah, because the bars run all night in Berlin, you know. They only have to close half an hour in every 24, as you probably know. Not like Stone Union today. No, <laughs> especially at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, there was one uh, club I used to go to in uh, Kreuzberg 36. Can't remember what it was called now. Oh, SO36? Yeah, that was, that, well, that wasn't the club so much, but yeah, that was there, that was there as well, yeah. That was, that was more of a hangout, squat hangout place, I think. Right. And, and did tonight, did it spark any thoughts from you? Like, do you see any similarities or, I mean, because, you know, for some people, the, the, the comparison works. Other people say, well, I, I'm not really getting the, the analogies. Did that spark anything inside? You yeah, no, it's it? interesting. Yeah. No, I thought this uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I know we've got some, we've got a lot of um, uh, expertise in the room tonight, actually. I know we've got Ken from Doom Gallery. I'm just uh, curious, actually, uh, Simon, I've, I've just, and it's just something that really occurred to me during this conversation, is that we're always portraying the artist as a victim of the sort of gentrification and the, you know, all of these, but, but are they really, maybe, maybe they're sort of uh, just as guilty as anyone else of uh, making these places uh, uh, desirable? You know, it's like who's exploiting who, you know. I, I I just feel that I've just noticed that that so often we're talking about the artists being pushed out by the the big bad um, developers. But it's it's very much a symbiotic relationship between these developers have obviously had the vision to know that at some point in the future that these places are going to be they're going to be wanted and their artists live there who sort of uh, create the culture uh, as has spoken a lot by the guy who I've forgotten his name who makes the ceramics uh, people move into a place for the culture and then it eventually uh, push the culture out so it's like I just wanted to sort of bring up that question is that why is the artist always the victim and really uh, is there a sort of relationship between the developer and the artist can I answer it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so please, please. Yeah, it's not even it's not even an uh, answer question, but your views definitely would be I'd be interested to hear. I'll give you an answer because I was I was in you know, I came to London in eighty nine. Yeah. And lived in kind of Cable Street and Shoreditch. Yeah. Um 
and was there in about 1990, 91. We, we were young, like yeah. 22, 3, and we'd absolutely no idea that when someone said to you, do you want to do an exhibition in our abandoned shop, you know, that there was some property developer or something. We just thought it was a great idea. And yes. if someone said, like, do you want to rent this warehouse out? It's really cheap. Yeah, yeah. We just thought it was great. And, you know, like we didn't, I guess there's other people of our age who were thinking, you know what, if I get a mortgage and borrow some money, off, you know, it's not a lot of money, maybe 50 grand, you know, like I could buy a place and it'd be worth a million in, in 20 years. We didn't think like that. We were playing in punk rock bands and we thought it was amazing. Yeah. And I think I actually put, I personally, you know, like I, partly to, you know, absolve myself from guilt, but partly... I think artists and even hipster coffee shops and stuff like that, startups are just a, a pawn in the game that's been set out. Yeah. You know, the, the Hackney Wick, for example, was was envisaged in the 90s, thinking about maybe there's going to be an Olympic bid, maybe we'll win it. You yeah. know, and then all the companies got together and, and, and worked, worked the deal out. And I, I think, you know, it, it, it's not as, I don't think the artists are the, are the, or, the, or the locals or the, even the people who come in the area and try and do a small business are, are, the, are the problem. They're, they're, they're used, you know, and, and a lot of people are very well and they just don't know what they're doing, like I was. I think it's like, it's like yeah, they are being used, but um, they're also using the situation. You know what I mean? It's like, that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, there's a kind of a lot of tones of sounds like, you know, these artists are the victims. They've been, they, they, they come in, they create the culture and then they moved out. Um, that's what kind of, it's kind of like, mm, I'm not sure that I like that, that, that sense that, you know, you know, that they're just mindless pawns. They're, they're also part of the process. I guess. I mean, if someone had said to me, they're exploiting the space. You want to rent a place in Stone Newington for forty pounds a week, or would you rather do the right thing and pay one hundred and eighty pounds a week, like <laughs> sort of across the road? Yeah. And, and All right. I get there you go. That's my answer. No, I paid forty pounds a week. <laughs> there you go. All right, and that, that, I suppose that answers the question. Partly. Have we, have we got Mikey here as well from uh, the People Speak? Uh, he'd have something interesting to say. I'm sure. I mean, I, 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 I do take your point, Ken. I, everything's more always more nuanced, isn't it? But at the same time, I've seen you see a few things and you just go, that's just nasty, isn't it? People with massive property portfolios uh, that yeah. are like playing the long game, buying land in advance. And they and then, you know, whacking people's rents up with absolutely no consequence of what it means for the people or and that that, you know, that's just like, mm, really, is, is that the best? Is that the best we can do kind of, you know, in, in, in 2021? Um but anyway, anyway, that's just my little contribution to, to that. But of course, it, everything's all complex and, and nuanced. Yeah. I, imagine, I imagine Sarah's got some opinions on that, um, but she may, tonight may not be the night to, to share them. But I know that's something she actually wrote about in her, in her dissertation, actually. I don't know if you want to share well, something, Sarah. Well, that's, I think that's why that spurred on that question from me. And I'm, believe me, I'm not really on the side of those developers, yeah. but they sort of, it's not their responsibility to decide what is valid in terms of an artistic culture. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, we're all part of this. You know what I mean? What yeah. my objection really is, is the portrayal of the artist as the victim. Yeah. And I think that that sort of really is, is, is that sort of very much what I keep hearing is like, Oh, gentrification shoved out. It's like, fuck that. It's like, you know, we're all part of it. You know, we're, we're part of, as you, as Pete was saying, you know, uh, exploiting the cheap rents and living in these areas. You know what I mean? But without the vision of like what's what the person that we're renting from is actually thinking. Oh, well, let's you know they've got a twenty-year plan and we've got a, like a two-minute plan. You know, so it's like uh, that's just my point. I think I will just pass it over now. But my uh, my my uh, comment was spurred on by that lady's. Uh, uh, the PhD lady, I forgot what her name is, uh, her comments that sort of triggered that thought process. So I'm, I will let that go and hopefully get some more insights. Just before I, I hand over to Sarah, I don't know if you want to say something in response. Just, just to, It's also worth pointing out as well, though, that the, the, the hidden thing in that 
in that chain is actually landlords because people give developers a hard time, but actually it's the landlords sometimes that are doing the really sharky stuff and playing hard and fast with people's sort of existences with their mental health. And I've seen some, and terrible things and the whole, the whole thing's messed up where you invite someone in and they pay you for, to, for, for, you know, to, for the right to do up your place, to make it cooler, to add a fortune to the land value and to the value of your building. And then you come in and go, right, thanks for that. Uh, you're out now. I've got someone in who will pay twice the rate. So just to sort of add that element to it, that the landlords quite often are kind of just doing this thing in the background and they very rarely get in the spotlight, but they're, um, they're a major part of the equation. But I don't know if Sarah wants to say something about that. Yeah, I mean, just just it's it's uh, it's the it's the sort of feels like the age old debate in a way. It's like it's the kind of debate of, um, you know, artists as gentrifiers. They're the ones being exploited, though, but they're also kind of part of the problem, part of the. But then it, it's about kind of think about thinking about responsibility as well. And who how do you hold um, an artist or an artist community responsible for something which they're they're using a space because they need the things that are available in that space which are cheap rents to continue working in a, in the space of time that they've got to work and I think yeah there's definitely been cases where you know uh, developers have specifically targeted artists to move into spaces to do them up so we you know there's sort of in are they victims I mean I think sometimes artists are the victims definitely and but are there things that artists could do to take more responsibility or some responsibility for the areas that they move into I don't know because I think these spaces grow sometimes quite organically. But also, um, I looked at sort of how Hackney Wick was sort of some in some way sort of deliberately um, constructed through sort of regeneration plans to sort of retain artist communities once they were already there. But actually, Hackney Wick was sort of ripe for artists to move into because of the kind of buildings that were available um, for them to you know to live and work in. So. Yeah, it's it's um it's a really complex issue, but yeah, I think both sides of the debate there are coming up and no no explicit answers, but good to kind of bring it up and talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and what about? I mean, we, we we could talk all night about gentrification, but what about what about the psychogeography? What about this idea that that our our uh, we can change the way we are in the world, and so we might walk like the Proust Proustian idea that if you can't change your landscape then maybe you could, the only thing you can do in response is to change the way you see the existing landscape. So you can't go to, you know, Barcelona. So what are you going to do? Well, maybe I can walk down the street in Hackney, <laughs> Hackney with different eyes. Uh, I mean, what do we think about that? A coping strategy for lockdown? I was going to say, it's very relevant now, Simon. Yeah, really, really pertinent now to be kind of, to be able to sort of take ourselves out of our, or not take, a, not take ourselves out of where we are, our locales, but to kind of, change our perceptions of our locales maybe on the daily basis in which we keep on seeing them because that's all we've got <laughs> but yeah I, I didn't know if you I was thinking about in your um, talk and also like in the film that you made the artist meet, uh, meet meeting the artist um, I was thinking about nostalgia quite a lot and how nostalgia like feeds into the idea of like where you are and the places that you are. And I don't know if that's something you, I don't know if you've already sort of thought about that or talked about it, but is that a big part of, you know, what the psychogeography thing could be about? I mean, this, this I don't know if anyone else has come on that, but, but obviously there's a massive link there because for example, that the, the, I, I was watching some some spiritual uh, videos, you know, it's kind of mind development videos about letting go of attachment. And it's all about just being in the now and forgetting what happened, um, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, last year or in your childhood even. And yet I think a lot of the psychogeography, uh, it does, as you say, it plays on notions of the past. And of course the past is uh, to some people, it's very, if you're a historian, obviously it's a super valuable, it's your currency, right? Talking about the past. Uh, whether it's relevant or not, is your is your living. Um, the marketing for these areas, the placemaking is very much based on history, isn't it? Grace and Perry mm -hmm. talked about authenticity, you know, wooden building in a post-industrial scenario. That's the aesthetic. And of course, um, so yeah, you're, you're, you're both the sort of commercial imperative uh, and the uh, psychogeographical critique, both of them are, are, as you say, very heavily drawing on the past. And I haven't thought a lot about it, but. Um, now you've said that and now connecting that with what I was um, hearing from someone talking about how to let go of attachment and to be very much rooted in the present. I'm going to explore that a little bit. So thank you for that. 
I think nostalgia also has a bit of a future kind of connotation too and in, in, in it's sort of like looking to the past to see what might have been but isn't any longer we kind of like it's like a, it's not quite present or past or future it's kind of I don't know there's a, there's a space that it operates in it's throughout time and maybe that's part of the psychogeography thinking is kind of time and timelessness or something I don't know just thinking out loud there. <laughs> I like it. So I mean, I'll just oh sorry I was just going to make a quick comment um it's relating to time and uh, psychogeography um, but linked to eco-psychology, which um, in the lockdown, obviously all of us who are getting out for, for our, our daily walks, finding whatever green space we can. Um, I'm fortunate to live near Wanstead Flats, so I'm very lucky to be able to have a lot of green space um, in, in East London. Um, and it's interesting, this aspect of time when you're uh, doing uh, psychogeography, because I, I really enjoy the rules, the hard and fast rules right now, turn left every tree. You know, there's, there isn't any kind of history or future in that. Um, but and, and at the same time, the eco psychology, that kind of encourages you to really engage with like mindfully with you know, nature and kind of really getting up and close and personal with it. So it's kind of, there's, there's two ends to it. That There's the right in the now, which is very liberating, kind of very mindful and, and, and good for your mental health. And then I also, like I mentioned in my comments, love the way that you talk. And I love listening to you because you, I'm not very good at history. I'm really passionate about it, but I, I'm not very good at it. I can never remember history, which is really annoying. But if, if someone's talking about it and invoking it the way you do, I love that kind of idea of uh, not being in the now as well, sort of seeing multi layers as you're walking through, sort of really connecting with the past. And, you know, it just gives you a, a different appreciation of the space. So there's, there's two ends of the spectrum there. There's kind of being completely in the now as it is. And there's also sort of bringing together. I haven't really got a question. It's just a comment, really, or a, a lengthy statement, more like. But. <laughs> always, always interesting, always insightful, though, Jordana. Thanks, thanks for that. We've got the vortex in tonight as well, actually. Wow. In the vortex. Yeah, so we've got some serious local um, knowledge and experience. Well, I'll say something. Well, I mean, because um, because I mean, the Vortex itself, of course, was originally in Stoke Newington Church Street and was a victim of a developer who um, doubled the rent suddenly. That's why. Because actually, when people moved to, to Hackney, and I mean, the guy who started the Vortex, who came actually, David Mossman, came from Bromley by birth, no one ever thought that the area would change as much as it did. That's why they never bought their properties or they never secured themselves. And I mean, the same was true if you look at Soho. You know, after the war, anyone could live in Soho. And that's when, when, when one looks at, at, at another jazz club, Ronnie Scott's, that's how they started. And they never owned the building and suddenly the rent is now a thousand pounds a day. But when they started, there was nothing like that. When the one said to them, you want to buy your building? They said, no, nah, it'll never not. There were, there, were, there were other things on their mind. <laughs> culture is all about um, was it the guy Richard Florida oh yeah he said that it's it's arts and and the gay community who actually help an area develop they sort of know and I've noticed that as well that musicians and things like that the good musicians they, they they know when an area is good value they actually that's and all those artists like Peter was talking earlier they knew that Hackney was a good place to live which before other people do I think Florida with his creative classes idea, I think he might have changed his mind now. I think Sarah's looked into all this stuff. I think, I think he might have changed his mind actually on the creative classes idea of Florida. I used to do the sound at the Vortex, Oliver, in the 90s when it was above that bookshop in yeah. Stone Union. I remember you there, very, very coming along. Well, that was it. It was lovely. I mean, but David Mossman was a genius, wasn't David, he? David was a legend, actually, yeah. I mean, he never he never got oh, the recognition oh. for what he was. No, no, no. Nobody thought it would end. It was just like, well, this is great. The rent's reasonable. It's a local street with local shops. It's really nice. Everyone gets on with each other. And then suddenly you kind of, I don't know, you just don't think about it. If you're the, guy, the guy who did it was called Richard Midder, who turned up when, when the Vortex, because the Vortex was turfed out, you know, and Adam Hart. It was Hackney Cooperative Developments. He was the one who got the Vortex down the road because he was up there for a gig by his brother. And he got us down the road. And, and Richard Midder, who bought the Vortex, one day turned up and said, didn't I do you a favour by forcing you to move? And I thought, well, uh, yes, <laughs> that's the old one. But he said, didn't I? And I just, I love the idea that he thought he'd done us a favour by forcing the club to move. Which is another way, it's a bit of double speak that some of these developers are also do, isn't it? 
I just don't know anything about art or jazz, basically, do they? Yeah. Well, I'd like to actually put, put something in the mix at the moment. I mean, obviously, COVID's changed everything. And I don't know whether there's going to be... Is there going to be an opportunity now for more creative spaces? It's just leveled the play field. And I'm, to my mind, there's going to be opportunities to create new and more community-based uh, developments. I mean, much as Grow, Jordana, I mean, what you do is brilliant. Um, you know, you know, using some of these other models that are sort of uh, community driven rather than sort of, you know, because we're going to have more spaces because, you know, uh, people are working more from home now and office spaces and workspaces are not going to be as important and that this is going to create whole new opportunities for artists and possibly to get together in groups to be able to secure spaces that can be used by the community and artists. And that's just something that um, is just um, going through my head after a half a bottle of Coke to own. Thank you. Some of, uh, uh, <laughs> of those office blocks in the city. Well, no, in, even in Hackney, I mean, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's all about space, isn't it, really? Yeah. I mean, having the opportunity, I mean, we had a gallery space in Ridley Road that was a fantastic space that I gave up for no reason it wasn't gentrification it wasn't high rents it was for no reason other than i wanted to give it up because i didn't want to do it no more but you know and, and so maybe i regret that now but i always think that they, i look around and i see spaces available and I, it's really about sort of uh forming active groups that actually do something about it and have a commercial way of actually thinking about how to do stuff like you know create a space that's run as a business that supports artists that's run by those individuals that doesn't lean on the sort of you know that maybe uses the fact that you can create you know get cheap rents now maybe uh, not have to pay so much council tax because if you run a charity there are opportunities there are always opportunities and i think those opportunities will come out of covid and we'll see that and i think that that maybe artists you know, instead of this as i know i've said it already this portrayal of artists as victims of of, of gentrification stand up and form that you know uh, collectives that actually uh actively create centers and opportunities for 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 creativity you know outside of the commercial sector yeah, our problem is a lot of those artists have been driven out already <laughs> So this, 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 the language is the, the language of this victimized artist is kind of like is a, is a narrative that you're all holding it's like stop it it's like you know it's not the artist driven out it's like it's like you know you it's not you know it's like you the, the artists are is responsible for making these places uh you know, of interest for developers. That the developers and the artists have worked together to to, to create that that the, the space. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that one of the challenges is, I mean, most people know about Grow. You know, we're not in the yeah. master plan. Um, so you know, we're, we're always sort of this is. It's interesting, sort of coming to terms with an event space that's thriving. If it, you know, in many ways, obviously, COVID. Uh, but also at one point we'll be talking about like you were talking about the vortex in the past, you know, it's at one point that 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 is inevitable. But I think that the, the challenge is, 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 is owning the, the land, owning the property. I yeah. think that that's the big challenge. I think if there are places up for rent, it might just sort of the cycle kind of starts again. Um, so I think, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a director of uh, uh, the Hackney Wick uh, CDT Community Development Trust, which is sort of, gaining traction and the aim of that uh, body is to try and um, own buildings because I think get, raising the finance to to actually be able to own buildings is, is just impossible it, within the London arena I mean outside of London might be different but yeah that that that's the that's the big one I think that's the you know uh, Ruben should probably do a talk about land ownership and all that because I think you know there's a whole world of challenge there that I, 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 I can't cover but it, it, it always comes back to that I think which is will be interesting to see how COVID impacts on that but the general word on the street at the moment is 
the buildings are still the uh, where the money is. So we'll see. It'll take them a long time to readjust. I mean, what what those what the property develop or the owners of the property are thinking? They just hope that when things go, they can get things will go back to as they were. And that's what that's so it's yeah. taking time until they will actually respond to maybe what 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 the forces will do. And I think. Yeah, fingers crossed. They might. It, it will. Yeah, I mean, artists they go to where what, what's lively at the time. I mean, they a reason also why artists, the musicians left Stoke Newington was, and they went maybe to Waltham Forest. A lot went to because there was, there was no, it wasn't any, it wasn't fun anymore. Actually, it was you know they found somewhere else and they keep moving. The musicians follow. I would say follow the artists. That yeah, they will. You know, artists are very good at finding places where things could happen, which is what we've seen. Just I'm talking about the circle, the, the loss of the loss of it. I, I didn't know any of this stuff till about seven years ago. I'm not Frozen. Florida. I was naive about gentrification, and um, you know. So I, I think, yeah, like space is. It's all about who owns it long term. You're going to get community group in, but if someone owns the lease, I mean, Mother Studios. Uh, my my friend was basically squeezed out of that in a very unpleasant incident. Um, and you know, if they want the building back, then there the are ways and means. So it's all about ownership, and it's it's problematical, isn't it? It's problematical. Um, you, uh, what you're going to say? I was going to say it might be a good time to wind it up, people. Have you, do you think you know a little bit longer? Uh, yeah. Do, do you, can I just put something in? Do you think at the time when 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 you have a lot of young people like I was and no guidance from elders really saying that that perhaps. With hindsight now, and 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 not just um, personal hindsight, cultural hindsight about the way this thing has happened, because you know, going from the sixties and seventies, properties were like five hundred pounds each. The economy was completely different. Um, the situation was different. You know, um, do you think with hindsight that perhaps it's a you know, I, I certainly feel a more of a duty at my age, you know, to kind of guide people and say like, listen, you need to own areas. You need to kind of do this. We made a mistake. You know, we were, it's good to have fun, but you don't have to be an arsehole kind of estate agent to speculate and think maybe we could do something to hold on to the community for the community, work with the community instead of just kind of living for the next 24 hours, playing punk rock, organizing gigs, you know, that, that kind of, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't think it's just personal hindsight. I think the world has actually, the neoliberal, it, it, it changed, you know, neoliberalism came in a different strategy in the, in, in the, in the 70s in New York, in, in, in Britain, in, you know, with Thatcher. And there was a complete shift in, in, in kind of ownership. And someone of my generation didn't really, didn't really get that. I, mean, I, know, I know what's interesting for me is Sarah put me onto things that I had no idea when I first came to Hackney that, for example, uh, there might be something called the Thames Gateway Regeneration Plan and that some people were looking 50 years down the line and that companies were banking land, individuals were banking land with the express knowledge that at some point London would push out and become fashionable. And, um, you know, that, that and I was in my 30s then and I still didn't know about these things. So I think we may be, we've, we've, we, we're, we are of a certain age, we've learnt a lot, we've been around the block, you know, and we've seen these things, we know how it works now. But, you know, when you're in your 20s, I mean, maybe it's just as well, right? Maybe you need <laughs> a bit of naivety, otherwise you wouldn't do something mm. um, if you um, put you in your 20s. But I'm, I'm not sure it's realistic, unless we can find a way of transmitting that knowledge to the next generation um but maybe that's just you know one of the things about life right you come into the world you make lots of mistakes you learn you get wise and then you get wise just in time to die and that's <laughs> <how> it goes <laughs> i was just going to say simon then the uh the situationists that we we, we sort of bonded over um I, I moved on a little bit to bifo baradi uh who who's who linked to it um and i needed a bit of hope you know because i was feeling quite like i mean i enjoyed the discussion about spectacle and I enjoy you know practicing yeah. it where I can but there is this idea of uh, our duty is to keep empathy and hope and the flame of empathy and hope you know for, for the you know next generations to kind of not to lose hope so perhaps um, that is what we can do we can't sort of maybe put people off or or try and kind of uh, but yeah I mean I'm I'm not I'm not wouldn't hopefully I'm not quite an elder yet but um 
yeah that idea of kind of keeping empathy and hope is important I think otherwise it's a bit oh, of course. got to have some fun as well I think I think that's probably a really hopeful yeah. well I, t- I tell you what this this might be a good um, a good note to um, to end on actually because as far as I know uh, I mean this is some pretty heavy stuff right but as far as I know uh, Guy Debord is still dead and life is short so maybe get a little song to play maybe you can hear this so all this is going on but and it's half eight it is late when you think and I, I, I do that only half tongue in cheek because it has been a tough old year, hasn't it? And um, we need our light and we need our hope and we need our empathy. Um, probably a good time to, to wrap it up, and maybe Pete, and to thank everyone for coming. There's some great um, knowledge. Yeah, we've we ended on a positive note. We've ended on a very positive note. Um, you've gone very quiet. But that's okay. <laughs> um, thanks for coming. Um, Simon Cole from um, Hackney Tours with an absolutely he's an, an in, inimitable, try saying that after two glasses of a Rioja performance <laughs> and, and debate that, that he's instigated. We, we've covered a lot of ground. We're all friends. Nobody's fallen out. We're, we're all on the same page, really, talking about a, a similar thing. Fantastic uh, uh, night um, of debate, part of Grow at Home Artist Talks, uh, which are every week. And hopefully see you at the next one on Monday and next Tuesday. Follow our Facebook, all that kind of thing. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Big, big, big David over there in the silent shadows making sure all of this ticks over properly. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks for everyone. Alrighty. There you are. Adieu.